Hey, JB2 World, good evening. Father Farrar here at the end of another good day. Hope you're well, hope this finds you well. Uh, the weather here in Krakow has been beautiful. Um, every day it's just been gorgeous. They tell me not to always expect it, but another beautiful day, I think it was about 70 or so. So, unlike yesterday, going to Chetova, which took two hours, or two and a half hours to get there and way more than that on the way back because all the traffic which came in large part because of road construction but then just also weekend traffic today however was a short trip to the Divine Mercy Shrine and John, uh, John Paul II Sanctuary so it's only about 15 minutes you know early in the morning no traffic so it's good to get there the Divine Mercy Shrine was created uh, following uh, the canonization of St. Faustina, who lived in the early 1900s, she had been given a series of private revelations um, that she recorded in a diary. That diary, after her death, uh, was floated around um, in circles here in Poland, uh, bishops, and then I think also in Rome, and it was viewed with some suspicion but when John Paul II was named Pope, then he had experienced it, read it, and um, understood that the translation was inadequate, so he asked for a new translation, and then it became clear that she, in fact, was really given quite a gift. So he um, canonized her, I don't remember when, uh, re uh, rather recently, right? Um, and he understood that uh, the world, after two world wars, was in need of a reminder of God's mercy. You know, that there was this deep suspicion of the human being, that we could have any goodness in us after uh, those calamities, those tragedies, those wars. Uh, and, and so he promoted this. He saw this as a real gift of God. Um, you know, that we don't have to be defined by our sin, but can be defined by God's love. And so I was able to be there and offer Mass, and um, there was a sister who came in at the sacristy before Mass, and she spoke English very well. She had been at the shrine, John Paul II's shrine in Washington, D.C. for six years. And so it was terrific to have her there. Uh, she said that as a priest, John Paul II would come and pray at this chapel and there were sisters who in their diaries would note the arrival of significant figures like bishops and cardinals and such but just wouldn't ever note the arrival or presence of uh, just a regular priest except they did note that there was this young priest who would visit and he just knew what mercy was about from his speech, from his conversations, they could just tell that he had been touched in a profound way by God and they recorded that in their diary. Uh, so I was glad to be there uh, to pray, offer mass, uh, and then uh, following the mass, so I guess it was actually before it, I stopped at the shrine, which was built to accommodate the large crowds, and I myself, uh, I was blessed to experience God's mercy in sacramental form by going to confession. You know, from there, I traveled across the way to the sanctuary uh, created recently or built recently in honor of John Paul II. So it was built in his honor. It has a guest house connected to it, but right now it's serving as a house for Ukrainian refugees. Uh, there's also a museum. But I would say the museum is not as extensive as the one in Pardovice, although they do have some um, great relics, meaningful relics, like the cassock John Paul II was wearing when he, he was shot. Uh, but then also there are all these other gifts that have been given over the years uh, to John Paul II. And one of them I saw was from uh, President Ronald Reagan, Ronald Nancy Reagan, so I, I thought that was just so cool. 
so f following uh, that visit, I had lunch, and yeah, that lunch looks good. It was good, and when you're in Rome, you do as the Romans do. So I had a little bit of their homemade vodka, this pear of vodka, very nice. And then I had kind of an open afternoon and I was able to walk the streets of Krakow. And as you can see, uh, and the buildings are, are so interesting, and beautiful, architecturally interesting, and oh, there were crowds everywhere, the streets were alive, and, and as I was told and as I found, Krakow is a very safe city. So I, I walked around for a while and then I went back to St. Mary's Basilica so I could get a, a closer view of the, the great altarpiece uh, that's carved wood that you're seeing, uh, different scenes uh, from the life of Christ, the life of Mary. So I was able to stay there and, and pray for, for a while. And then I thought I would just offer maybe a word about architecture. So you could think of architecture as the built form of ideas. The built form of ideas. You know, ideas about creation, about the physical world, about human beings, and about God, you know, especially when we talk about churches. Modern architecture doesn't have to be this way, but often, it sees buildings through a utilitarian lens. That's kind of the idea, one of the principal ideas. It just provides space that isn't related to what's occurring inside, except for maybe the size, you know, how many people do we need to accommodate? So buildings don't participate or embody the interior acts, nor do they point beyond themselves to a hidden reality. That can end up with a building with decorations just kind of pinned to the walls, but not integral to its construction. So this way of building comes from, you know, a utilitarian idea and an idea that matter is it, kind of materialism, that there's no connection with the divine if it's even acknowledged, which leads to the worldview that the physical world is at our disposal according to whatever our technology allows us to do, whether it be a building or the human body or the human person. Man, in this perspective, this worldview, stands over it like a god, but then confines himself to the horizons of his limited imagination. You know, classical architecture, on the other hand, sees the physical world as transparent to the divine, windows to eternity, reflections of God himself. So the ancients understood that there were lots of small s sacraments, lots of things that were visible reflections of an invisible reality. There's all the stars, the mountains, the oceans, the thought of different dimensions or qualities of God. So they understood that buildings participate in the interior acts. They're reflections of those happenings on the inside. You know, secular buildings can be built in this way. I mean, take, it this build, take a look at this building where Starbucks is. It's where I'm filming this. Or this theater. You know, its, its purpose is embodied in its very structure. You see the, you know, the masks, you know, in the, carved in stone. Well, churches, what are their purpose? Well, they're there for offering the sacrifice of the Mass, participating in the death and resurrection of Jesus in eternal worship of God, during which the faithful are nourished with God's life and they collaborate in His work of bringing about a new heavens and new earth, you know, paradise. You know, so what do we see in classical architecture? We see ceilings that extend to the heavens so far that the angels participate and at the same time are modeled on the canopy of luxurious trees in a garden or a paradise. Walls and ornamentation teeming with vegetative life. Glass that allows the sun to join in the celebration either through translucent illumination 
or the sparkling glass, which is a reflection of the heavenly walls and floors described in the book of Revelation as a multiplicity of gems. But the physical church arises not firstly through technology, but through men and women alive with God's spirit and life. Pillars, as they're called in the Acts of the Apostles. Pillars are columns. That columns represent something beyond themselves has a long history. From Old Testament accounts of erecting an altar with 12 columns for the 12 tribes of Israel, to the Greek construction of columns based on the proportions of the average man, woman, or child. And sometimes the symbolism becomes even clearer as in columns like this one in St. Mary's here in Krakow. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. Our bodies are a reflection of our God-given interior reality. And churches that fulfill their purpose make visible the invisible reality we celebrate within them. Now, I don't know about you, but for me that makes me interested, anxious, excited about making the invisible visible in our buildings church, to the school, to everything else. That's it for now. I'll say good night, and I'll see you tomorrow after I return from a more somber day at the concentration camps. So, Auschwitz and Berkeley. Good night and bless you.